Hey, how's it going guys? Today I'm going to be taking you through a game that I played about two and a half years ago in a like chess congress tournament. This was the last round. It was a fairly unremarkable tournament, but the game itself uh, in round five was really interesting. So <clears throat> I thought I'd take you through it. Um, I was rated just under 1900 at the time. My opponent just under 1800, who starts with d4. I really, at the time, liked playing the King's Indian, and I still do. He goes for a London system, um, which, this is 2021, so the London system was, like, ridiculously popular back then. I mean, it still is now, but in 2021, yeah, everyone played the London. So, I just continued playing King's Indian style. He goes proper London style. Um... The kind of bishop on e2 in f4, with the knight coming to these squares, is really typical. And he wants to go c3, and the point of h3 is to tuck the bishop back on h2 after something like knight, knight 2 h5 to attack the bishop, right? So that's the reason for the setup. But we're not going to go into all the opening theory. Black's main breaks, of course, are e5 and c5, hence the knight going there to support them. So we go rook e8, looking to play e5 at some point. My opponent castles. And e5 is possible, because we have three defenders to his three attackers. But I don't go for that. I go for b6. And he plays c3. And I put my bishop on b2, because I don't really know where else to put the bishop. If I bring it to f5, I can get hit with g4 or knight h4. On d7, it isn't really doing anything. So I figured, even if I weaken the light squares a bit, I can get my bishop on a nice diagonal. And my opponent plays b4, just taking space on the queen side. Here I can probably challenge it with a5, but I can also play knight to d5, which attacks c3 and the bishop on f4. I threaten to take the bishop and double the pawns. And the bishop can't retreat to defend the pawn, because the pawn is in the way, right? My opponent plays bishop c4, which is a really cool move, because if knight takes c3, queen b3, and he threatens f7, and the knight. In this position, I do have d5 to counterattack the bishop, but I decide that I don't want to go into that. And here I should have taken on f4, but I play knight 7 to f6, because I kind of like having a knight there. And my opponent can't play e4, because then the bishop hangs, right? And c3 is still under attack. So he brings the bishop back. And again, if I take on c3, queen b3, d5, takes, takes, takes. We know, well, probably queen takes, because otherwise I can take here. But we get the picture, right? So he retreats his bishop to h2. I go b5, which, if taken, allows knight c3. And I attack the queen and the bishop. Queen c2, I take the bishop. I mean, knight is actually trapped, because it has no retreat. But I am going to probably take on d4 and beat up a pawn in this position. So my opponent doesn't take here, and he instead retreats. And here, it's really all about, can I take on c3? Here if I take on c3, queen b3, I can probably go here, but... Again, I played this game a little while ago, so I don't know exactly why I didn't take. I think because b5 was going to hang at the end of some lines once my knight gets out, I decided just to defend it instead. So my opponent goes queen c2. I go knight d7, which the computer hates, but my idea is to put it on b6 to control white's pawn breaks in the position, because b5 is quite tender. Right, that's my main weakness in the position. So my opponent plays a3, which is a bit too slow. Like, really, he should be trying to play a4 and undermine my pawn before I can get a knight here to control his breaks. What my knight also does from d7 is control c5. And if there's a big exchange here, my knights, there, uh, my knights are awesome c3 is going to fall, the bishop's under attack, the queen's opened up, 
and it's a crushing position. So White can't just trade without thinking about it. Instead, he goes Rook A to C1, because if I take either pawn, he probably takes back with the C pawn in both cases, and he opens up the C file and potentially tries to get to C7, right? So I go Rook to C8, just put in a piece on the file. Can't be bad. Queen B2 is played, which is a bit weird because it puts it right in line with my bishop. Even though there's two pawns currently in the way, those pawns could disappear. So this pawn disappears, and there's some tactics on this pawn where he can't recapture. You know, It's just an odd move, right? So now I put my knight on b6 to look at these squares. And my opponent brings his knight back to b1. I assume to cover um, a3 and c3. But this is also a weird move, because my bishop can, if this knight moves, take on f3 to damage the structure, right? I go e5. Again, there's mistakes flying everywhere, but, you know, I'm not a computer. Do it, does it really matter? No. I go e5, because this trade really suits me, because I want to go c4. I'm threatening e4 to fork these, so say he brings the bishop back, I can kick the knight out, and then maybe I can play c4. This looks really good. I can get a knight onto a4. Maybe I can do it straight away and put a lot of pressure on c3. It's an interesting position, right? So my opponent goes e4 to counterattack my knight. And I bring it back, which the computer hates. It wants this, this, this. So I get an attack on the queen. If the knight takes, I can take here and just put a lot of pressure. And if the queen just moves out the way, I'm just winning a ton of pawns. Now this, that's, I, 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 I get three pawns for the piece, right? But that's such a tough thing to play. Instead, I bring the knight back. My opponent closes up the position. So I play c4, kick the bishop back. And then f5, which is always the big idea in a King's Indian structure. So when you've got the pawns on d6 and e5, and white locks it like this, often you want to play f5 to break apart the structure. Especially with all the pressure I've got on d5. If this pawn falls, this pawn's, this pawn's going to fall. And white can't play f3 to defend because the knight's in the way. So he brings his rook to d1, trying to add another layer of defense. I play bishop h6. Now, I probably could have taken, but bishop h6 is a fine move. Just get my bishop onto a more active diagonal. He takes, I take, and then he takes on e5 with the knight. And I believe he offers me a draw in this position. That's, that's what it says on my notes, on my little uh, scorecard here, which is very difficult to read, but he offered me a draw. So I obviously declined because I'm going up a piece. He does have some complications uh, with the attack on the knight, but I can play knight d5, which is very well protected, to cut off this rook's defense of the pawn. He takes on f5 with an attack on my rook, so I move the rook to attack the pawn. Brings his queen to e2 to transfer it to the, to the king side and to put pressure on e5. I take on d6, which was, you know, kind of the point of bringing the rook to c6, because that pawn is so annoying. And then he takes on e5. This bishop isn't actually attacking the rook, because it's pinned to the queen, so I don't have to worry about that. I play queen g5. The computer doesn't like it, but I do have ideas of this in the future, and I'm attacking the bishop, and if this bishop moves, I'm going to attack his other bishop. So I thought it was quite a good move. My opponent goes g4 to defend the bishop, but that massively weakens his king. So I go queen h4, attacking h3. He goes queen to e4. And here I play a really interesting move. I play bishop to f4. This bishop looks like, looks like it's hanging, but remember this bishop's pinned. 
So I can take the queen. And the queen can't take because the knight defends. And, well, my knight actually is sort of pinned to my rook. This bishop can't take my rook because it's pinned to the queen. <laughs> and I've got a lot of defense on this knight, which is really holding my position together because it defends the bishop and cuts off the file. So it's an absolute clump of pieces in the center. So my opponent bails out. He bails out and trades the queens off because I'm about to take on h3. And his king can't move up because there's discoveries on this diagonal. And he takes my bishop, which puts us on... Because he, he sacrificed the knight earlier with... Uh, where is it? Knight takes e5, remember. So I am up a piece. So once the queens get traded, he gives up a bishop here, but then wins this bishop. So we're equal material, but I have a piece for three pawns. So I'm, I need to try and win some of his pawns. And these pawns are looking real weak. Real, real weak. I tap the bishop and he retreats. And then I come to e6. Could I have come to e6 straight away? Probably. But forcing the bishop back, is that good? I actually don't know. The computer likes it. But anyway. I suppose he might have been able to go to e3. I'm not sure. But rook d2 tries to prevent me infiltrating, which I do anyway. Then he plays rook c1, which, I mean, he just hangs a piece. Because I'm going to win his knight. Slow replay. This isn't the case if he... I don't know. Uh, let's say he plays here. And then I go to the back rank. He doesn't have to take me. So this knight doesn't hang. But in this position, it does. Because he has to take me. Because his rook's hanging because he's trying to defend c3. His idea is, he's worried about this. Because the knight is forced off of the defense of the pawn, because it's overloaded. It's defending the rook and the pawn. So he goes to c1 to try and defend the pawn, and hangs the knight in the process. At this point, I'm pretty sure my opponent was down to like, f I don't know, five minutes or something. So it's understandable. This is a 90-minute game, so very long time so I win a knight and I'm up two pieces for three pawns which is obviously winning so he goes b he brings his bishop I can't speak to e5 defending the pawn and he's getting ready to throw his pawns down the board because that's his only chance I bring my knight to a4 to gang up on the pawn and he brings his king and then instead of taking the pawn I go rook to b2 because it's more important for me to get the rooks off the board. Because then it cuts his all of his chances of drawing. So we take take. He goes f4. He's got to get these pawns rolling. But this is a fairly easy conversion. I threaten the bishop. I take the bishop. And I have two pieces. Um, I take the pawn. It's going to start marching. These pawns look threatening. But they can't actually do anything. Um, I'm always going to have some kind of defense. And after knight to d5 check, my opponent resigns and I win. Which I think left me with a score of 3 out of 5 for the tournament, I believe. Which, I mean, it's not, it's not bad, but it's not amazing. So yeah, that's the game. Hope you guys enjoyed. I thought it would be really interesting because, you know, it was just such a complicated game in the center the first the first capture only happened on move 23 23 moves before any any pawn or piece was captured which was a mistake actually but you know this insane position we get here where all the pieces are just clumped up and there's pins going everywhere like it, it's just chaos right there's so much going on but yeah, I think my pawn play in the center 
was the winning factor in this game. This f5 break is so, so good. And my opponent really makes a mistake by allowing me to like clear the ENF file by taking with his pawn. And then ends up giving up a piece to try and win back enough pawns. But it, it just isn't enough. It isn't enough, and it's a winning end game. And my opponent blunders on the back rank with rook to c1. And it's an easy conversion from there. So, I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, please drop a like and subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And with that, have a good one.